Well, again, I welcome everybody this evening to our class. And as I was just saying moments ago, it's uh, this is a topic that there's so much said about it when we talk about you know, producing food or growing, gardening, those kinds of things. It's like, what can I do that would be unique or different enough for you to spend your time here? Well, I hope I've done that. And between this week and next week, get you some additional information or maybe get you thinking about things that you have not considered. And it comes down to this. The time may be close at hand that you will only eat what you and your community tribe produce. That's what it comes down to, what you're going to be able to make uh, in order to eat. Now, that's a kind of a uh, kind of a scary topic for some people. It's like, oh, my gosh, we're talking gloom and doom here. And we're talking like, gee whiz. Well, maybe it doesn't mean that the stores are completely empty, but it might mean that like some things are not available and or the price, because we see costs going up quite uh, regularly right now. The, the cost of food and the availability of some things is really, really getting to be a problem in a few areas. Now, down where I am so far, I've been able to buy everything I want, but I'm listening to some people saying in other areas that they are not able to get some things. And or what I do notice in our shelves down here and up in the valley up north there, that... Um, the shelves, there's sections that are empty for maybe two or three days, maybe for a week. It comes back, and that's good. We have things. But by the same token, that could be the tip of the iceberg here. So you might want to consider that in your thinking about this. Now, the real question comes back to why. Why, why do we want to consider this? So I'm going to tell you some of the sources that I would go to. And I will publish at the end or I will make available for you. And I'll tell you how to get it kind of my list of some of the people that I listen to. One of the tops of the list on trying to figure out what's going on and who in great depth gives his sources and his quotes on those things. That's Ice Age Farmer. If you're not familiar with Ice Age Farmer, I really recommend that you go and watch him. Now, I don't know that you have to watch everything that comes out. Now, some of these guys are publishing, you know, one and two videos a week. And you can get buried into listening to this stuff endlessly. I don't do that. I don't have time to do that. I pick up enough information from them and I go search through their videos to say, this is something I need to really look at. Now that bottom one down there, which is water, making the most of it growing in the mega drought. He's in California is where he's at. So he's very aware of the drought and he's worth listening to in those areas. So again, I will publish these things or tell you how to get a hold of them from me. Sai Sage Farmer, another one that's worth listening to Goshen prepping and some of the things that he talks about has a lot of videos, um, the coming meat shortage, the collapse from the coming hyperinflation. Now we'll hear, in fact, if you just go in and type in the words inflation or hyperinflation, you can spend a week watching all of those things. So again, you have to be selective. And sometimes I get into watching one of these things that goes for a little while. I don't like necessarily the style or how he presents himself. If there's some people are all hyper jumping around and what have you, I'm just like, eh, okay, well, it doesn't fit my personality, but that's just me. So Goshen prepping is one worth listening to. Riverside Homestead Life, another one here that you may want to look at. And here again, you select the ones that fit best for you. Those top two, Ice Age Farmer and Goshen Prepping, are two of my very tops that I like to listen to. This guy right here. Not quite as, I'll say, sophisticated, but he's got a lot of information, so you might want to listen to him. Another one that you'll look at, this is a little more Hollywood produced, and that's Epic Economist. But here again, you're getting information that may help you make a decision what you need to do, how you need to do it, when you need to do it. So consider that. And there's a bunch of miscellaneous ones here. And then I'll include these here. You don't have to write all this down. I'll include them on that uh, if you want to request that list that I'll send to you. So what we're talking about here is thinking future. And when we're talking about the future, it really it's about sustainability. And that's for the long-term future of you, your family, and your whole community. And then within that, we may want to think about what we call permaculture. And that's a self-maintaining. Now, these words are selected very carefully. Self-maintaining, life-supporting process of agriculture working with rather than against nature through modeling the, the natural ecosystems. So we're not trying to work against it. We're not using artificial things. We're going like, how does nature do this and how does it keep it in balance? Because 
what if you can't have um, access to the things that you've been going to the store and buying all these things? What if they're just not there or you can't get there uh, or they're not being delivered in time? So that's what we talk about in the permaculture and it's a self-maintaining, self-supporting system. Here is a book and there's also the audio. I highly recommend you get this. Folks, this ain't normal. Joel Salatin. Now you can go look up Joel Salatin and he's got lectures and things out there, but I really like this book and I like it in the audio form. I have both the printed book, but I also have the audio where Joel is reading the book. You get a feeling for the personality, the intensity, the, the, the passion that he pours into this because the way we're living, our lifestyle, how we're producing food and a whole bunch of other things, it's not normal. It's, it's, a, it's against nature when we go back to this idea about permaculture and natural process and modeling what nature does rather than fighting it, this is a book for that. And there's several of them out there uh, that you'll want to get. In fact, the, um, the introduction to the book is by um, Alan Nations, who is uh, one of the proponents of how we do things very naturally with ecosystem. Okay, get that book. I recommend it. Now, preparing your future by having resilient and sustainable food production. That's what it comes down to, this idea of permaculture. Because if you can't go to the store, you need to be able to get it. And maybe it's just you and your neighbors. And by the way, I'll never emphasize that you're going to do everything yourself. Frankly, you probably can't. Very difficult to do. So don't try, but you're going to have to form a community. And you hear me talk about that all the time. So most important of all, to be practicing permaculture now. I, I don't, if you haven't even ever planted a seed in your life, that doesn't make any difference. You practice now. You gotta go poke some seeds in the ground, get some water on them and kill a bunch of plants and do that a lot. I've killed a lot of plants in my career here and I don't have all the answers, but I'm um, working at it. I'm practicing all the time. You should be doing that too because those mistakes will teach you a great deal. Now, when we're talking about learning about doing these things, I'm going to take you right back to Ice Age Farmer because you'll see that he's talking about from a strategy standpoint of what's going on, but he also gives some great information on how to do things. And if you remember in last week when I finished off in the library talking about the structure of the library, you go from the, the, the big picture of things into the strategy, and then you go into education, then finally go into the details, into the fine instruction. And so you'll want to consider how you, how you approach this. And Ice Age Farmer is going to fill in all of those things. And some of the instruction in you know, making the most of water is one of those things. Then another one you may want to listen to is Gardner Scott. And one of the, the videos that he's posted, he's got lots of them out there. It's the 12 survival garden crops to grow. And this is the list of them right there, plus some extras that he threw in there. And he, I like these, some of these guys because how they approach it, how they're, I'll say, both simple, but they're giving good details and things. And this is where you get good information. Now, the reason you want to be watching videos now is get some of this stuff in your head, but then you're going to need some books. We'll talk about some books because when the internet and electricity is gone, well, you got to get something to refer back to, but hopefully by then you're starting to practice some of these things and it's just second nature. Urban Farmer and all these names that I've given you, if you just go onto YouTube and plug in their name, Urban Farmer, he will come up. How to convert lawns into profitable urban farms. And this is for somebody who says, well, I got no space. I don't have any place to go. You got any grass? You know, well, yes. Okay. We asked the question, what's grass good for anyway? Well, in my house, when I moved here, this would be 18 years ago, we had a yard of mud. Uh, they had sodded the front yard, which was great that they had done that. Uh, but the rest of the yard was not sodded, but it did have sprinklers. And I just let the natural grass come in because that was better than the boot sucking mud that we had to wade through in the spring. So I keep grass for two reasons. One, to keep the mud down. And I'm also building topsoil in the process. When you're letting the grass grow and mowing it and putting the, uh, the clippings right back on the grass, I just mulch them in. And I can tell that I'm building soil because my sprinkler heads are becoming more and more recessed into the ground. I'm building topsoil around them. 
but also what's grass good for? Well, it's a cool place to sit in the shade. It's, you know, feeding some of the small animals for a little while. But the strategy is grass is very durable. It recovers easily, so I can let it just dry out. This is last year when the grass was dying because we didn't have enough water. Well, it's coming back green right now. So, and I just let it go to seed. And that's how I got my grass to reseed. And I have about four or five different kinds of native grasses and some uh, grasses have been added in with uh, just by letting it go to seed and taking care of itself. I haven't fertilized, I haven't done anything to it. Uh, I've just let it grow. But the idea is to replace that grass with food crops and that's part of what I'm doing. Now, what can you do with grass? Well, if you have a lawn, and you want to turn it into a garden space, there's Hopi Pale Gray. Plant it on the grass. And this is a, a squash plant. It's a winter squash that takes a lot of room. It'll cover up the grass for you. You can just mow around it and grow that squash out there in it. And um, you can do that with other things. But squash is a really good thing to do uh, on the lawn uh, because uh, it'll just grow and it'll cover up the lawn. But the best thing to do is to eventually start converting that lawn and the, to maybe you want some green space still, that's just fine. But as far as I'm concerned, I really shouldn't be growing anything, spending water on it, I should say, that I'm not going to eat. Somebody that you want to listen to is John Jevons, his biointensive things. He's got a lot of books out there. He's got a whole course online, biointensive growing and things. His is a no-till. Uh, double dug and you hear these things. So there's a lot of methods. You find what works for you, your climate, your conditions, your health, your whatever it is, what you like to grow, where you are, you find things that work for you. But back to this idea of expanding what you're doing. Now, this is a few years ago. My original garden space is right over here. We see these tires. This was where it was. I now have four times that space. And one of the times I had a guy come in with a plow because this ground is hard and break this sod up in here so I can start turning it into something useful. I've planted a lot of things out there. Uh, this is looking back from, or looking down to my, my original garden space here, which were there. We've now moved over here. I'm moving into this right here. Last year, I planted in this a cover crop, you know, tore up the grass, planted in a cover crop, and then I'll be working that in and eventually killing those things out. But I planted a cover crop that has a, as a legume that will help to fix some nitrogen in the soil and putting a lot of compost on it. So expand, expand, expand. Uh, you know, my premise is that you probably should be growing more than you've ever grown. And if you've grown a lot, grow more. It's a lot of work. I understand that. And we don't have a lot of time to work on those things, but I can't eat that grass. Now, what you could do is you get some chickens, goats, and rabbits, pen them out there and have them eat the grass, and then you eat them, milk them. That'll let you eat the grass, but you'll probably get a little tired of that. Looking back the other direction from where that is, this is the section that we've been growing in. Here's that whole area with this cover crop on it. And what really stimulated me to do more of this is, you'll see I have a fence around my yard. I have a real deer problem here. Now, in hard times, there won't be much of a deer problem because when I talk to the old timers that live here in Spring City, uh, you go back into the 40s and before that, they didn't have deer downtown because if it showed up in your yard, you harvested it is what they did. Now, we're not allowed to do that right now, but in hard times, that'll probably happen and we won't have many deer. But until then, deer would absolutely ravage my garden. So now that it's fenced, I really can go to town growing uh, with a lot of things. I, I I've fed the deer for years. Maybe they'll feed me one of these years. Now, when you're thinking about this idea of expanding your growing, you may want uh, the area. You may want to also expand some of the crops that you do. You may want to experiment with some of them and play with them. In particular, there's some things that are almost like weeds. This is amaranth. Amaranth is a very hardy plant. You can eat the, the young tender leaves and the shoots. It's a, it's a green vegetable then. And then when you let it go to seed, it makes these millions, I do mean millions of tiny little black, red, or white seeds. Now, the challenge is they are tiny. You'll have to learn how to harvest them and use them, but they also have a good protein profile. It's uh, kind of like quinoa in terms of how it has a, it's a good nutritional profile 
and uh, amaranth will do that. And amaranth is, it's tough. It's, it would be considered a weed by some people. You don't have to give it a lot of care for it to grow. It needs a little bit of water, yes, but it is, um, it'll choke out other weeds and things like that. So you might want to do something like that, but you're also going to have to learn how to harvest those millions of little seeds. I've done that. I have buckets full of them. And uh, I'm going to go into another area in my yard, and I'm going to start just planting amaranth because it'll just take care of itself. Other crops that you may want to consider, maybe you like them or don't like them, this is kale. Um, that kale that you see in the left picture right there, that was taken on December 4th. You can see it has frost all over it. I did nothing to protect my kale. Uh, it really, and we were, we went well below zero. We were 12 below zero one time. We had several nights below zero and a lot of temperatures in the single digits. And it hammered that kale. What it needed was a little, little protection. If it had a little hoop house over it or what have you, that stuff would have been happy all through the winter. But of my four kale plants, one of them is now coming back. The others, they didn't make it because that's pretty brutal on them. But one of them is coming back and I can start ha harvesting here in another week or two. In fact, I could have been harvesting already, except I left my gate open to my garden and the deer got down in there and grazed on my kale. Understand some crops have some real advantages. In another class, we'll be talking about them, but uh, there's potatoes and there's also beets. These root crops, including, you know, the carrot, they have an advantage because they can take a lot of frost, particularly when they're coming up in the spring. If you have a late frost that comes in and kills the vine on the potatoes, eh, it just comes back. It, uh, it'll make it. You can also overwinter potatoes in the ground. Those red potatoes, I'm digging those in the spring in that picture. And, this, and that was back in 2012 when I did that. The picture on the left is beets that I dug this spring, just uh, quite just a month ago. I was digging those beets. I got almost a wheelbarrow full of beets, and I've been eating lots of beets and uh, juicing beets and getting ready to plant more beets because they're a very, very hardy crop, and they're also freeze hardy. Um, they, will, they will take pretty stiff freezes. They don't like to go below zero as far as the plant goes but they can go down into the teens and they'll just kind of wilt a little bit and they'll come back. I've harvested a lot of beets in December, just digging them out of the ground. If you'll cover them and learn how to do it with putting straw over them and then earth over top of them, they really work well. Of course, you can leave the carrots in the ground. Those are spring carrots there. Those are carrots that I dug in April. Uh, you can also dig your carrots in the fall. And then if you don't have a root cellar, what I did was that's a wheelbarrow. Those carrots are in there. Just straw in a wheelbarrow, leave the tops on them and just put them in the wheelbarrow. Keep the straw damp. You can do it in damp sand. You can do it in other things. I have, I don't have sand. I've got clay, but I have straw. And so straw uh, and put those down in there. And then you just dig down into your straw bales and pull out the carrots. So these are things you should be practicing. My garage is unheated. And so it gets kind of chilly in there and it's just fine. They never froze, no problem whatsoever. You may want to consider that you need something more than just um, the vegetables. It's, it is quite difficult for most people to do a purely vegetarian diet because of some of the nutrients that are missing. Most of the people that are vegetarians right now, most of them are using supplementation to make up for some of the things they don't get very easily. One of them being the omega-3s. The egg is an excellent source of omega-3s, not the store-bought eggs. They're not so great. The eggs that you grow where they're eating the natural grains and particularly in the summer grasses and the insects. Boy, those chickens have a ball with the grasshoppers. They love them. They chase them all over creation. It's, it's actually a lot of fun to watch them doing that. So chickens, ducks, rabbits are some of the animals you can consider because they're small. Um, you know, there's goats and sheep and cows. Those are a little harder to take care of and keep them pinned. But the chickens work very, very well, and rabbits can be great for them. Rabbits will eat all your scraps and stuff left over. They'll graze on your grass. One thing about rabbit, and if you're using rabbit meat, it is very lean, and it does not have enough fat to sustain you. You will have to have another source of fat. It'll give you the protein but they're too lean uh, and it's called uh, protein poisoning, protein starvation, rabbit starvation, it's been called, where people have lots of rabbits in the winter and that's all they had, they could eat that. But 
but their health really declined. So you'll have to learn to get some of the other nutrients that you need. Eggs is a great way to do that if you don't want to have other sources of protein. Um, another thing you're going to be dealing with, of course, this is why you want chickens and ducks. And that's some of the bugs. I had an infestation one time on a few of my, uh, my squash plants. And the reason they would have an infestation on just one and the one right next door didn't have it is either that was a weak plant genetically and or where it was planted in the garden, it wasn't too far away from the other. Somehow the soil was wrong. It was getting the wrong nutrients or what have you because insects are attracted to unhealthy plants. That's one of the reasons why you want to be building your soil, which is one of these topics that we'll talk about another time a little bit here. Building your soil. You see that soil that's on the left right in there, that kind of pale stuff? That's my natural soil here. It is really grim. Uh, it will grow some of the native grasses and sagebrush and things like that. But if you're really wanting to produce anything other than amaranth uh, and dandelions, and dandelions do pretty good in there, but it doesn't grow much uh, very well. So you build the soil and you really do not want to build it with chemical fertilizers. You want to build it with natural humus type things. They'll build humus, and that means compost. You can make barrels like that that I've done for composting, but for my size place, I need lots of compost. So compost bins, and I've done classes on that. We'll do some, but you can read about it. It's not that hard. Make a pile and let it rot. Uh, don't get it too wet. Don't let it dry out too much. I like to use bins, and I have these bins that I've been using for years. Uh, that was actually the first thing I did for my garden when I got here. The next spring, we moved in in the fall. The next spring, I set up the, the bins and started putting everything in it. I had neighbors who would mow their lawn. I got their grass clippings. Uh, I had a, a guy that lived close to me that he was a lawn, he had a lawn mowing business. I said, dump it in my yard. I'll take it. And then everything that comes out of the garden and all the scraps, as I said, I leave my grass clippings right in place, but I'll take others. And then leaves. This last fall, what a find. I had a guy that was bagging up leaves on his property, and he had, uh, there would have been 30 trash bag, big trash bags full of leaves. I said, what are you going to do with those? He said, well, I hope I'm somebody to haul them off. I said, I'll take them. I had to make three trips with my van to get all those leaves home, and I put them in that bin, those bins right there. Leaves are wonderful because the tree roots go deep and they pick up lots of minerals and things that you need. So you want to learn to compost. And in the long run, you need to understand you are a fertilizer factory. Now, the first and easiest to understand is, let me use this as an illustration. Now, my wife doesn't like to attend some of my classes because some of the things I talk about and I tell them this is what I do. And she's like, oh, golly, do you have to say that? Well, I don't teach something I don't do or live. You see those green strips in there? This is over the winter where I was collecting, and it's easy for me to do this. I would just collect the uh, urine. And then when this two and a half gallon jug was full, I'd just take it outside and I just pour it along on the snow in there in the grass. I wanted to see what it'll do. Well, that's what it did. This is in, I don't know, March or something like that. And this grass is greening up. So what does that tell you? nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, trace minerals, and things like that. The only time that you might not want to be using urine and some of the other stuff that you cast off, we'll talk about that in a moment, is if somebody is using um, a lot of drugs, pharmaceuticals, uh, psychotropic drugs, and things like that, some of them may be kind of weird to get into your garden and your soil, so you might not want to do that. I'm not taking any drugs. I'm doing everything naturally, so I use my urine. Now, I'm not suggesting you pour it on the, the garden necessarily. You can put it in, well, this is where it goes most of the time. Sometimes I will put it actually directly in the garden or when I'm starting to amend the soil and work on it. But most of the time, I just haul it to compost bins and dump it on those, those leaves. Remember I told you they're brown? They're mostly carbon. What do they need? Nitrogen, phosphorus. They need those things. Well, I'm casting off nitrogen and phosphorus all the time along with some other minerals and things I have. So it needs to go in with those leaves. And then that takes care of any of the things you think about. Oh, yucky. Um, by the way, I do a whole class on urine. We'll do that another time. But here's the other one that you need to seriously consider. Getting these books. Now, uh, this is uh, Joseph Jenkins. The first one was the Human Ore Handbook. 
buy it. Now, you can get it online for free, download it in a PDF, but then if you print it out, it costs as much as buying a nicely bound book. So I suggest you buy the book uh, and learn this because this is the technology of turning human waste into human manure that you can use and doing it safely. The compost toilet handbook is second book. Excellent. Well illustrated in there what you can do very simply. You don't have to spend the big bucks on the systems you can buy and you can buy some nice ones. But if you don't have that kind of money, well, let's consider what you could do. And there you see that loop to close the loop from the waste that we have and the garden and everything. You, you compost it, but you have to learn when you're dealing with human waste, fecal matter. If you've been to my sanitation class, you know that fecal matter is one of the most dangerous substances on planet Earth because we spread lots of disease. So you've got to do it properly. He will teach you how to do it properly and how you'll know that you've been doing it properly. And one of the things that you will need to have about the only piece of special equipment you need is you'll need to have a, a composting thermometer that's going to be, I'd say, at least 20 inches. That's what I have. I've got a couple of these 20-inch thermometers. So I can be sure that it's getting hot enough, hot enough to, number one, kill all of the pathogens. And there's graphs in the book to show you what level of what temperatures you need to get up to so you know you're killing them and also you want to kill off the weed seeds that are in there and other things that are undesirable if you do it right then you can use this now you're going to compost it and then recompost it again because dust to dust it came out of the garden it's over the long term it's going to have to go back into the garden or you're going to deplete your soil so you might want to learn how to do that practice to do those things but don't do it casually and don't do it without education and be sure that you understand how to do it properly. Now, what we've been talking about, of course, is a lot of classes and books. Uh, and I teach a number of these things and other people teach them as a long list of things. It's like, oh my goodness. Well, then here's some of the books and I'll give you some of the, some of the best books. But by the way, there's books coming out all the time. And just because this is the book that I say you should have, now there's a few of them I'm gonna tell you to get. Folks, this ain't normal. You need that book. That's not an optional book for, you know, long term for you to get your thinking and your strategy straight. There's some other books that I believe you must have. Some others may be optional. They may be fun. And you may find others that you think are as good as those. So there's a long list of books that you'll want to consider getting, at least a few of them. And I'll give you my top priorities on these books that you'll want to get because it's about growing. See, I didn't call this a gardening class because it's about food production. And you're going to need the gardening things, but you're going to have to have some other sources most of the time, unless you're a very experienced living on a purely vegetable based diet. And you can do that, but you're going to have to eat some things you're not used to eating. Uh, purslane, by the way, is very high in omega threes. Well, most people don't like purslane. And if you don't want to eat purslane, you better eat some eggs is what it comes down to. Or there's some other things, of course. So books are some of the things that you'll want to get and have and be studying not to put them on your shelf and say, someday I'll read that. You read it now. You practice these things now. And also about preserving the foods is one of the other parts, because yes, you can grow it. But if you don't have refrigeration or freezer, well, then you have to take care of it the way we used to do those things. And of course, we come to seeds. You need to have seeds, lots of seeds. And you want to have them in storage. And of course, you can be buying and rotating seeds. And we talk about open pollinated seeds, meaning they're heirloom seeds that you can, you know, keep the seed from year to year to year if you do it properly. But you're going to have to learn how to do it properly. But first, you start out with the storage of seeds. Well, you have to learn how to store seeds properly. This is my seed storage that I just took pictures of just a couple hours ago down in the freezer but you have to understand how to properly freeze seeds. If you don't do it right, if they're not dry enough as the bottom line, it'll kill them. Now, the other thing about these bagged, uh, these tightly sealed things and in the cans of seeds, you need to understand that seeds actually have a metabolism. It's very low. They're, they're hibernating, but they're not completely dead. If they were completely dead, they won't come back. So hibernating seeds actually need a little bit of oxygen. It's kind of like the equivalent of you taking a breath. Uh, oh, once a week you take a breath. And that's the, how low level their, um, their metabolism is. So you can put them in the refrigerator. That'll, that'll keep them. This is a whole stack of boxes here with seeds in them. 
this is seeds right here. These are seeds I just bought, I several thousand seeds, quite a few thousands of seeds. And there's some bins down here that are full of seeds. You want to have them. Now, will all of those seeds, here's seed, well, I have some seeds from 1985. And I haven't treated them well. They happen to be beet seeds. I've learned that beet is really has a tough seed. My 1985 beets were stored in a shed, hot in the summer, cold in the winter. They're still in my garage. Uh, I don't think, I, yeah, and I think I finally put them in the refrigerator, but they were not in the refrigerator for 25 years. They, I get 100% germination out of them. At least it looks like 100% because it's amazing. So some seeds are tough. Onions are not very tough. Onion seeds can make it maybe through the next year, maybe one more year, but you keep them cool and dry. They don't seem to freeze very well, has been my experience. Now, what are you going to do when the seeds run out? You've used them all up. Well, that's where you're starting to practice these things about saving seeds. And probably the, the, the best of these books is Seed to Seed by Susan Ashworth. It's very good. There are some other seed saving books uh, that you can learn about. And one of the other authors that I've interviewed and talked to, she talks about saving seeds, but she refers back to Susan Seed to Seed as being the best of the books to get. Now, one of the things that I'm going to start doing, and we will begin next week with part of this, is uh, The Resilient Gardener. This is one of those books that is not an optional book. You must get that book. And to go along with that book, I'm going to be publishing the interviews that I did with her when I was doing my Self-Reliant Living show, that I was interviewing Carol Depp. I did 12 interviews with her. I've got, you know, some 14, 15 hours talking about the book and about other things. She's a delightful lady. I think I'll have part of it available for you next week in our class, let you listen to part of it. And then I'm going to publish those 12 interviews. It'll be on my website. It'll be in the member section in there to where you'll have access to them. So you have those interviews, you have her book, you put those together as you have a real powerhouse of information. And the reason that I promote hers is when I found this book, Okay, Resilient Gardener, eh, interesting name, Food Production and Self-Reliance in Uncertain Times. Okay, that caught my attention. That sounds kind of good. That's up my alley. And then the subtitle below that, including five crops you need to survive and thrive, potatoes, corn, beans, squash, and eggs. Bingo. I knew she had something there. Now, she talks about other things too, but that's the primary ones to give you the nutrient value that you need and the calories so that you can keep working hard. When you're out there turning your soil by hand and hauling wood by hand and everything, you need three or 4,000 calories a day. And you're not gonna get that on leafy green vegetables. The leafy green vegetables are very important for the nutrients, but you need calories. Calories are in the potatoes, the corn, the beans, and the squash. The eggs gives you the omega-3s that you need to supplement the rest of it. And of course, then you also have the meat from the eggs that you can use if you want to. One other topic we're gonna to dig into for us in the West out here. Now, I, some folks back there, I see Leroy, you probably don't have the problem we have. We got a drought. We have a mega drought, big drought, huge drought. And it's not getting better. Uh, and it may deepen even further. So we're gonna to have to learn how to do with a whole lot less water so I'll be talking about that some this next week and in, in future weeks in my drought class. And I'll show you what I have done. Now you go back to the, uh, the Ice Age farmer, listen to what he says about that. He's got strategies in there too. I'll show you what I've done and what I'm doing again this year. I'm setting up to because I will run out of irrigation water. Probably it'll be, we'll get cutbacks um, late June or into early July. <clears throat> and we'll be almost completely out. It'll be off for maybe a week or two, and then you get water for a few days. So I'm going to have to be using culinary water, which is really expensive water versus my, my uh, secondary water that I have. So you'll need to learn about that, the strategy on what you're going to do and some other things you can do, because this drought issue is serious. It's getting worse. And uh, if you're going to be growing food, you're going to have to learn how to get along with that. Of course, one of the things you use is mulch and stuff like that. And there's a lot you can learn about doing those things. Part of the reason I want to be thinking about lessening our water use, because they say, well, we got the springs. Yes, but we have some wells that are starting to run dry in here. We've got to take the pressure off the, the aquifer 
so that we'll continue to get water that we need for the bare necessities. So I'm gonna have to be very efficient in water use. So here again, mulch will be really important to reduce the, the usage of water. Well, um, what I talk about in almost every class is, you never wanna be doing these things alone. A community is important because you probably can't grow everything that you need. And you actually wanna be coordinating some of your growing particularly when you think of things like corn. If you're trying to save your own seeds and you have your next door neighbor is planting a totally different variety of corn, maybe it's a flower corn versus your sweet corn, and now they're getting all mixed together, you're gonna to get not what you wanna keep your seeds for. So one of the reasons you wanna have community when you're thinking about gardening and growing is so that you can coordinate some of the things you're doing. Listen, I'll grow the corn this year, you grow the squash. And I'll provide you with all the corn. Don't plant your corn because you're going to mess up my crop or we'll do it the other way around. It doesn't make any difference. Get friendly with your neighbors and or move to a place where you can be friendly with your neighbors and then coordinate some of the things you're doing. And don't try to become an expert in everything. I have some people down here that are really, really good at some of the things they do. I'm really good at beets. Let me tell you what, I can supply beets to the whole community down here if I want to because I don't have any problem with beets in my ground or carrots. They do very, very well. Some other things I have a little more trouble with. So maybe I'm the beat guy up here for some of my neighbors. The point is this, when you get down to doing these things, loss of food supply infrastructure will not be a threat to you if, first off, you're fully committed to self-reliant living. You have knowledge, you know your options, what you can do, K equals I times E. You know, knowledge equals information multiplied by experience. See, the experience is critical. Owning the book doesn't do squat for you. What you need to do is read the book and go play with the book and get good at it. Find out what you're good at, what you're not good at. You also have knowledge of some of the proper tools and things you need, and you know how to maintain them, take care of them. Uh, you have sufficient food in storage. And this is one of the questions that comes up. People say, well, <clears throat> how, how much food should I have stored? Well, it, depend, I mean, it depends on how much you're growing right now. Well, I don't have a garden. You better have seven years. I'm serious, you better have seven years. Having one year or two years is not gonna get you through because you're gonna to have to figure out how to live long enough and not starve to death, take care of some of the other emergencies while you're getting the garden going and digging up your grass you've been killing with weed killers all along, which are not gonna have a lot of earthworms in it. So it's gonna take you a while to get things going. And you may have some unusual weather that comes along and kills all your stuff that you were planting. And so now you've got to go longer or you get a skinny harvest. You need lots of food in storage. And that just blows people away. I'm just telling you what the truth is really. And I could back that up to a whole bunch of other things. Now, if you have a sizable garden, and let's say that you're growing half of what you eat, 50% comes from the store. Uh, and 50% comes from your yard or the trade that you do with other people. Doesn't mean you're growing everything that you use, but you're growing excess and you can get some things from other people are growing excess. But 50%, you probably need three-year supply. If you've got 100% that's coming, pretty much 100% coming from your garden and your production, then well, a year would cover you because you've got to have enough to make it through one of these times when you have total crop failure. So you might want to look at it that way. Another thing, number five, already mentioned this, you are part of a true community that you're working together with other people. You also can find and create needed resources. In other words, you're gonna to learn to scrounge and, and make do with things because you understand, you go back up here to knowledge and your options. What do I do when I can't go to IFA and buy fertilizer? Well, what you should have been doing all along and what you keep doing is you're now composting all that you can. And then what about all that good fertilizer you're throwing away? Well, you better get going on that one because you got to put it back into the soil, but you've got to do it right or you end up sick. So you understand what your true needs and priorities are and you can create what you need and find resources around you. You live by the personal survival beatitudes. That's in another class about your attitudes and things because if you lose your attitudes about things, you're not going to make it anyway and you currently produce more than is practical. It's more, pra well, it has been more practical. Forget the garden, it's too much work and it's expensive and it takes my time away from whatever. I'll just go to the store and buy it. Looking at the prices now, it might be practical to start buying a lot more of those things because it's getting kind of pricey to go to the store. 
So that's kind of the, the, the attitude, the outlook, the strategy, the overview of what you need to be thinking about. And that's all this class was intended to get you thinking and start moving in that direction. And whatever, however much you have been growing, do your very best to at least double it this year. Now, if you haven't grown anything, well, okay, then you better really get hustling on things, but just double it. I've been working on doubling every year, and I'm going to do that again this next year. I can only handle so much at a time, but I'm preparing my soil. I've got the composting going, all those things. So I'm looking ahead, thinking ahead. Now, I invite people to you know, go to my website. If this is the first time you've been here, then jimsway.com. Uh, I've got things that I'm starting now to post back on YouTube. I haven't been back on Facebook for a little while. I have to admit that because I've been just too busy to do that. But I'll start getting some things in there, new things. Provident Living Times is the newsletter. And please send people to the newsletter and send them to these classes. These Wednesday nights are free. You like to get the Provident Living Times because it has the link in it. I've been using the same link, but in the future as I grow, I may have to change to using a, a, a unique link each time. <clears throat> So that's why you want to get used to getting the problem of living times and using the link that's in there because there's reasons why I may need to change in the future. Lots of things on my website are for free in the, the public library that's there. And then I have the members only library where I'm publishing other things in there that are some of these really significant claims. They're all significant, but some of them I'm trying to figure out how to pay for what I do. So please send people to subscribe also because that's where you get the sanitation class water class and some of the others uh, that were all in this together classes in there. So send them there and you come there again, back to the website. Now I said, as we'll go to some questions and answers for a moment here, if you would like to have the, the names or the, the books and the, uh, the links that I talked about here, and by the way, it's a whole bunch more then if you'll just send a request for get out and get growing book list and link list, just send it to my company email, gemswayworks at gmail.com and just request it. I'll send it to you. I'm not posting some of these things yet because frankly, I don't have time to post them. Um, when I get a little more help, I'll be able to do that. But right now you need to request it and you can send anybody that hasn't been to my class. They can go there. I will have this class in the public library within a few days. I'll have it up for people to go to and send people to it. Your neighbors that aren't growing send them there to get them growing because eh, they're going to be on your doorstep begging for your food. Or can I come pick your cucumbers? And it's like, well, why don't you have some? So you want to get people going around you. So get out and get growing and help other people do that. All right. I'm done with this presentation. Questions, comments, and when you're done, we'll hang up. I got a question for you. Yes. Um, I've done very little gardening and what I've done has not been very successful. But what I did learn is when it came time for harvesting, you're looking at 24 seven and a lot of supplies to get all that stuff uh, taken care of. Are you going to be addressing that in future classes? We, we will do some of that in here in harvesting. Of course, one of them is how do you preserve these things? And you have several choices that you need to do. Um, and I'm, I'm dehydrating things all the time. I mind well, it's dehydrators off right now. I didn't have anything to put in it, but I've been dehydrating things. And you, of course, can be dehydrating things that are in your freezer and get them into more long term. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the challenges of harvest is that if you do it the way that sometimes I've done it, you just kind of plant everything because you're getting in a late, you know, here it is, oh my heck, it's almost July, I better get this stuff in so I can get a harvest. And so you get it all in the ground and then it all comes on at once, you know, and you're just buried, you're killing yourself with your harvest. Now, if you have, like I used to have, we had six boys, you know, and I could get a little help on that. It's me and my wife and we're getting old. And so it's a lot of work to do that. But uh, so you want to stagger plant. Uh, I've got some things that are going to go in here. We're, we're probably beyond the really hard frosts that we're going to have. We may have some light frost in the future. In fact, I've got, we're going to go 27 here in a couple of days. But the things are still in the ground, will be underground, it won't hurt them. So you stagger plant things so you don't kill yourself trying to harvest all at once. But it is, it is a challenge, but it's a heck of a lot better than 
not eating. I guess is what it comes down to. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. But I'll tell you this, there are people online, there's videos that already exist where other folks address that stuff very well. And so I don't try to teach what everybody else is teaching exactly. I want to point you in the direction. And one of the things I want to do, and as people find, I'll say, um, videos that are online, YouTube and Vimeo that are really good ones, if you'll send them to me and we'll review them and Hopefully I have a little staff one of these days will review things so we can put up the best of the best. What I tried to give you in these links are some of the ones that I think are the best um, that cover the major part of the topics that you need to cover. So I'm, I don't need to reteach. I don't need to invent the wheel again on some of these things. Just encourage you to get it done because <clears throat> looking at some of the stuff that's on the horizon, I hope it's not there but it sure as heck looks like it is. And the way it's being talked about is to prime us for some of these things. You listen to some of these um, links that I gave you. And even if it's only 30% eh, true, ouch, we got a problem. I mean, it's, it's easy to fall into complacency and we have a generally a society of that. Now people are on these calls and come to the, to the meetings and those things. That's who I want to help as much as I can because you are all my neighbors, even though Leroy, you're on the other end of the country, you're still my neighbor right now because we can communicate. And I want my neighbors to be able to take care of themselves because uh, they won't show up on my doorstep. And you probably won't exactly. show up on my doorstep, but you know, it's help everybody around us so that we can be okay and not be at each other's throats because exactly, desperate yeah. people do desperate things. Max, I see you on uh, unmuted here. What are you thinking? Oh, I've got a, a couple of questions. I don't know if we have time for it. One, uh, one comment first, uh, as you mentioned, leaves, fantastic uh, compost, except um, as I've learned that black walnut leaves are right. the, so you got to understand what that tree looks like and and not have that, that to hurt my brother's yard really badly. But um, the other thing, a couple of things. One, have you heard of Marjorie Wildcraft and the Grow Network? Yes. Okay, any thoughts on uh, on that? Um, very worth listening to uh, her. I haven't, I haven't done a lot with her, but I'm familiar with her and I've watched a few things in there. And so she's very good. In fact, that's one of the topics that we should be exploring. I'm not an expert in that. So I would rely on other people to talk about some of the wild crafting that you can do and using some of these foods. I have neighbors down here that periodically we have a class and we go around and find all the weeds we can eat and those things. And we're going to need to do more of that. In fact, I just recently bought a book that's about all the, uh, another one on uh, very well illustrated and all the um, edible things around us, medicinal plants. And you, you just need to start doing more of those things. And um, I, I'm learning to, to do that more and more, but I don't teach classes in it because other people do a much better job of that. Yeah, she has this, uh, occasionally, maybe once or twice a year, she has a, a Grow Network Summit, and she'll invite all these people to come in and do mm -hmm. uh, an hour-long class. Uh, like one guy says, "How do you how do you identify what's killing your an your animals?" And, and I thought that's a great great idea to find out what mm -hmm. is, so you know how to protect against those things and uh, how to do you know intensive gardening, um, agriscaping is something I was very impressed with, and um, the, all the different microclimates that are in your property where. You can't grow something on the southwest corner that you can grow on the northeast corner because it's not in the hot afternoon sun and and uh, things like that. But next week and how I'm doing it, and I really cut my water usage last year. I really used far less water than I had been using previously uh, to take care of this garden, and we didn't have a weed problem. Um, and but I learned some things I'm going to pass on to do. And, and and again, do what works for you but you've got to experiment and try things. I've tried um, uh, doing different ways and what I'm doing now seems to be working the best to give me the production and to not take the resources of time, energy, and water. I'm dealing with really heavy clay soil that I've been amending for years and it's getting better. Um, but um, I need to bring in several truckloads of, of uh, crushed granite would be really great to put in there, granite sand, but. And it costs money, so I have to deal with what I got. I'm going to be here pretty soon. I'll not quite a quarter of an acre. I'm about a 
maybe a fifth of an acre is what I'll have under cultivation. That's significant. And I can't do the intensive in that. And if you look at this picture here, you'll see how the water drains down into the rows. So that when I do get a rainstorm, they come through in frequency, but they rain hard. Uh, maybe only puts down an eighth of an inch, but that eighth of an inch ends up being, you know, an inch right in that row. And the rest of those things where the weeds are, they're not getting watered, which is just fine. I don't want them to be watered. So this approach seems to be working well, but I'll, I'll cover more of that next week. Just expand, grow, and do more. Yeah, everybody needs to get real busy growing a garden and practicing because you learn a lot as experience. That's and key. and I'm serious. Most people, I I would say 99% of the people in this country will not do it and are not doing it and will be hunting around for food. Yep. And and I mean they'll roam around at night. And when the people get hungry and thirsty like that, they get desperate and they'll do desperate measures. That's correct. So we need to be doing it and helping our neighbors as much as we possibly can. Well, we've been at it an hour and we'll do another hour next week. And then following that, we'll get onto the energy side of things. And I'll be publishing things in the meantime that uh, we've already done before. I'll get them on the websites. I'm just going to focus on doing as much as I possibly can on getting things available to people. And I will simply ask everybody, if you like what I do and how I do it, as I put in the newsletter, please refer other people to the newsletter, have them sign up for that. They'll get some information there. They'll get the links primarily right now. Bring them to the Wednesday night class, to the Saturday class, and then uh, promote the subscription. I made it low enough cost that anybody that really wants to learn, they can afford to do that. And I have classes in there that you will not find any place else in that depth. They don't exist uh, all in one place. And so that will be some of the premium things that you can get for your $5.99 a month. So I'll encourage them to do that. And also send me topics that you would very much like to see covered. If I can cover it, feel like I can cover it, I'll do it. Otherwise, I may do as I've done here want to give you, hey, this guy covers it very well. Go listen to him. I don't have to restate what he says. Go listen to him. And so that's why I'm always interested in people that find a really good uh, YouTube or Vimeo on a topic. Let me know about it. And uh, I'll try and review things or have somebody else review them. And we'll put up the best of the best. Uh, we want to train people. That's my whole mission is to reach and teach as many people as I can, help them get what they need. Thank you very much for showing up. Any other questions, you can email them to me. Have yourself a good evening, and I'll see you Saturday. Bring your questions then, and then next Wednesday also. Good night.